Happy New Year. Welcome back. Uh, it's our birthday, and we got a master in the house. Welcome back, everybody. You're in Pensado's place. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being patient with us, dropping back by. I hope everybody's holiday was as good as mine. I had a wonderful time. Got to reflect. Got to do a few mixes. Got to kind of catch my breath. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you guys got a lot of good work in, too. Uh, over the holidays, I know Herbert did. They had a, they had a chance to get away from us for a while. <laughs> they probably needed that break. <laughs> so what'd you do? Well, I know what uh, you did. We did it together. We saw a lot of each other. We uh, tried to decompress and take advantage of this. Think about this great thing we have that they provided for us. I and know. Uh, it's good to be back. It really uh, is. Uh, it's funny. Dave had called me leading up to this show, and we've been talking a lot about what we want to do this year. Um, and there are lots of places we want to go. Um, our, our philosophy and feeling is that we want to take this to the next level, mostly because of what you provided for us, which is incredible support. So we're going to explore different guest areas, you know, ADR and Foley and mobile and gaming and electronica, lots of stuff. That stuff is coming. We've been listening to your requests. Um, there's some execution things that we're going to do that are going to be real interesting, that are going to be advantage to you. Um, we're going to perfect and bang out those ITLs that you guys think is valuable. So we're excited about all that. Um, also wanted to thank, we got just incredible gifts and oh, statements and stuff on Facebook from you guys from all over the globe. Um, Max sent us expensive wine. Oh, Max, um, my buddy, an Italian buddy. Yeah, we got, um, oh, this one is funny. You, you know, the, the polo fetish. Oh. Polo now, really? polo forever. <laughs> so one of our clients sent polo, Canada. And then he had a thing in, in the West End, if you're a Gordon Ramsay fan or a London fan, dog's bollocks apparently means a really good thing. So we had done a negotiation, and he called me the dog's bollocks. So on the shirt, Dog's bollocks means dog balls. So, um, just to show your creativity. I'm not uh, sure. You remember that scene in one of the Cheech and Chong movies? He could be movies? just, he could be dogging me and the I just don't know. The scene in the Cheech and Chong movie where, where, he, where one of them tells the other one, whenever you see Mexican people, go, hey, pendejo. Uh-huh. Uh, where are you going? I, I, think that, I, think, I, I think that's not exactly... Okay. I'm yeah, I think, I, I, I think you went up to the line and went right over. I'm going to pull you back. So anyways, lots of good stuff. Again, on the comments, we had, uh, you know, Leo, mm -hmm. which you're going to talk about, said yeah. some great stuff. Scott McClellan, we just got had an interesting conversation this morning about our guest with T.O. Carvello, and on and on and on. We're just so happy. Also, as usual, our buddies are with us. Vintage King, say hi to Vintage King. Hi to What's Vintage up, King. Guys? We love the guys. Um, Chevy. In our chat room will be Jeffrey Ehrenberg manning our chat our chat room, and there's Jeffrey's uh, picture and information up on the up on the screen. You know him well. Jeff's in there to answer all your questions. Manning our chat room is Drew Adams, as always. Yeah, Drew, say Drew. hello. What the deal? What the deal? <laughs> and in English, that was hello. In Palmdalian. Uh, <laughs> in Palmdalian, that's what's, what's up. <laughs> um, last piece, too. Um, just we've had so much demand about the MixFest competition for the attendees. We're going to push back the announcement of that winner till next week. And that'll be next Thursday, so it gives you more time, gives us time to, Dave, to really make uh, that information to, to make that judgment. You can see the info to enter on our website. So to get, go to pensadosplace.tv, there you see it up on the screen. So make sure you get that in, and we'll make sure we take care of that. Lots of stuff. Our homework is our normal homework. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube channel, you know the drill. We don't need to go through it. Make sure that you like and subscribe. Before we ended the year, and I'm about to wrap up, we had incredible YouTube placement because of you. Those likes and subscribes make that happen. Love you for that. We want to show the power of this space this year. So we're going to engage you and join you and, and have you do some things, and we're going to show folks what audio means. So that's my stuff. I'm going to expand on what Herb just said, guys. Um, to, together, we could do some really cool stuff. We can, we can get... We can get power to have some of the manufacturers listen to us and do some of the things we want. We can improve products through our collective uh, efforts. Uh, there, there's things we can do charity-wise. We can help each other out. We can, we can take this craft and art of ours to the next level. Uh, you guys are incredible about helping the newbies out on the website and on Facebook. There's, there's no attitudes. Anybody can come ask a dumb question. I know because I have. 
and uh, you guys are pretty polite, so thank you for that. Another thing I was thinking about, Herb, is on today's show, Alan Meyerson is, 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 a is, genius. is one of my heroes. I, I, I started mixing because of Alan. Right. Uh, I heard some of his work with Cameo, and I was in Atlanta working with Cameo. And uh, I heard I heard I heard what Alan was doing, and, and it did it did two things. It made me want to quit engineering, and then and then after I got over that, mm -hmm. it it it, it uh, Alan became kind of a, a hero is a is a is a catch all phrase, but he was someone I respected and I wanted to emulate. I wanted I I saw what could be accomplished by someone with gifts and talent, and someone that had put a, a hell of a lot of time and effort into into honing his craft, and I wanted to be Alan in a week. I didn't want to wait. Turns out I had to wait quite a long time. But I, I just want to speak to you real quick in, in a couple of seconds about how to use your heroes, because I, 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 I blindly kind of kind of used my affection for what Alan did to, to challenge me to grow. I knew I couldn't be Alan, so it kind of forced me into trying to be the De Pensada version of Alan. And, um, I, I actually wore out CDs, ask friends of mine, I actually wore out CDs listening to his stuff over and over and over again. And um, when, when you have a hero, when you have someone that, that you really and truly want to be like them, uh, approach it carefully with some thought and, 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 and try to use it for growth, try to use it for inspiration, but try not to just copy or emulate. Uh, it, when I tell you, this is the way I do this, this is the way I do that. Invent your own version of that, and I think you'll grow a lot faster. So, having gotten that off my chest. Let's uh, introduce your hero. Yeah, I just want to shout out to Leo Saramago. Absolutely. Uh, check his blog out. Leo, uh, if, if, you're, if you're live, list your blog information on, on the chat room, and if not, just throw it up on Facebook. I read all the articles, and there's some good stuff on there, Herb. Actually, we can go better than that. We can do... His blog, I think, is Music Revolution. I'll, I'll pull it up and then we'll announce it to you. Okay. Uh, actually, it's Music Revolution. It's Worldwide Music Revolution at blogspot.com. Really yeah. cool stuff. Yeah. Anyways, let, let's get to the giant in the house. So, guys, yeah. uh, without without further ado, I want I want all of you all of you to meet Alan Myers. We should actually hear a round of applause right now. Oh yeah. man, <laughs> I hear angels sing. Holy crap. Thank you for coming. <laughs> now man. what do I do? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> the show's over and I'll Should I see you guys. That was great. Hey guys, I'm just going to take that with me. Guys, do you remember, I forget who I was discussing it with, it might have been Neil Pogue where we were talking about like, like, like there was an engineer named Alan Myerson and he would like, he would like pull a track up, EQ it, mess with it, and it never got touched again. The fader never moved, the track never moved, and when Alan was done, there was a mix there. He just adjusts some level. Uh, like nothing I've ever seen. You, <laughs> remember when you were in, in, at Enterprise in Studio, uh, you were in B, I was B, in C. B, that's the first time we met was at Studio B. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I was, I'd come and you in. Walked in with a, you walked in with a folder of CDs, and uh, we shook hands, and you said, i got to ask you something. On this track at 2 minutes and 12 seconds, <laughs> there's this sound, and I wanted to know, and I was like, wow. <laughs> uh, I couldn't believe that. That's fantastic. Uh, Man. Uh, but guys, um, there's 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 a reason why this is our 50th anniversary show and that Alan is the guest because Alan you're going to learn from Alan the breadth and width of 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 what uh, talent can do in taking you somewhere in the world of audio. There's so many different things Alan is gifted at. Uh, recently, his his interest has been uh, drawn uh, by the um, he's been attracted to the the film scoring mixing, which is you want to know pressure, we're going to talk about that. But Alan has mixed uh, some of your incredibly favorite films. Uh, I mean, he's, he's mixed 180 films. Um, five of them have had won Academy Awards for Best Sound. Uh, he's won Grammy, uh, multiple nominations. But Inception, he mixed that. Uh, the Sherlock Holmes movies, Transformers movies, Call of Duty, Pirates of the Caribbean movies, uh, on and on and on and on and on, Traffic. A gladiator, Shriek. Shriek? Shrek. <laughs> That's like Shrek. Did I say Shriek? Oh, yeah. my God. Shrek. Dave doesn't go to the movies, in case you didn't know. Uh, I do go to the movies. That's all right. We'll, we'll move forward. No. It was this I green wrote, guy. Uh, I wrote down. And it made him I, Shriek. I was <laughs> talking right. when I wrote down Shrek. I looked and I wrote down Shriek. So, <laughs> so, so 
I actually am correct because I read my notes correct. But but yeah. literally, <laughs> this, this this is a giant in the field with giant movies for those guys who go to movies. And 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 the beauty is not overstatement. On top of that. Um, is you're one of the most requested guests we've had. We've had lots of requests for you. Well, so I am honored by that. I'm let's let's yeah, depart some information. And, 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 and tons of records, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll do the records. Uh, I'll just talk about those individually as we go along because I want you I want you guys to be exposed to some of the stuff that, that he's done. Alan, um, man, let's just jump right in. Okay, uh, let's go. If I had to if I had to go record an orchestra, I, I, I wouldn't know where to start. How, uh, how, how do you approach recording an orchestra? Just a, a little tiny bit of your, your, your physical setup and then uh, emotionally and mentally, you guys need to know that thousands and thousands of dollars are sitting there. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we, the average cost is about $100,000 every three hours. Whew. And uh, and that's quite a responsibility. First of all, it's an honor to be here. I, I had no idea it was your 50th show, the first one of the year. So, really, thank you so much. And oh, it's been great knowing one. you for the last 20 some odd years. Oh, thanks, man. Um, so, so basically, the orchestral thing, which is my favorite thing to do in this business, because the relationship with the musicians is really what what powers me through this. Um, uh, and there's two really two ways. I approach it. One is if I'm doing a hybrid score mm -hmm. where the orchestra is going to be part of a big production package. And an example of that would be maybe a Pirates of the Caribbean or an Inception where a tremendous amount of work has gone into um, the pre-production. Mm -hmm. The computer uh, mock-up is not really, it's, it's the master. And uh, then the orchestra is added to it. And, and I approach that a little bit differently because what we tend to do in that situation is record things in separate sections. We'll do the strings separate from the brass, and then the percussion will be done beforehand and then tightened up and really made to be... How many tracks do you end up with? Well, um, <laughs> on, a, on Inception, uh, which the director, Chris Nolan, actually said to me, I need to know, is this the biggest music mix ever? And I, and I looked at him, I said, without question. We had, on a couple of cues, over a thousand tracks, a couple Huge. of cues closer to 2,000 tracks, wow. and actually on the new Batman coming up, we had one uh, suite that was over 4,000 tracks. And, oh, and, my God. And what happens is, so, so when you say it like that, it sounds <laughs> crazy, true? but... I whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds crazy, but, you know, if you think that 40 tracks is one pass of orchestra, mm -hmm. so you have to think of that as one thing. So you don't think of it as 40 tracks. You get the sound of the orchestra, and it becomes a thing, and literally it becomes a fader on the console until I need to get in and get some detail on the violas or on the celli and then I hit a button, it spills open, and then I can ride individual faders. So a lot of my time after the recording, and I know I'm jumping ahead, no, no, is, no. is spent in the pre-mixing, you know, uh, of mm -hmm. all of these elements. You know, uh, Hans uh, Zimmer, who I work with uh, a lion's share of the time, is into huge percussion production, and we record per percussion all over the world uh, with different mic complements. And uh, and a lot of times, my job is to take that percussion and just completely mess with it, make it sound inside out yeah. or upside down, edit the crap out of it, create something that didn't exist. Wow. So so I'll take a 24-track pass of percussion of Tycho's, and I'll cut it to match a pre-recorded thing, get them to lock up, and then that becomes a sound, th those two things together become a sound that's just larger than life, not, nothing you could create mm -hmm. either with uh, a computer or with a live orchestra. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to live in this third world a little bit where we're creating sounds that just are unique. So, so when we hear these things, this is you we're hearing. This is a your, lot of it your, is, yeah. I mean, I mean I'll, I'll, Hans is one of the awful well, he's the man. Ever. I mean, and and, yeah. and I, I might be the one. I might be the one executing it, but he's really the one that comes up with yeah. the idea. Who he's the one who gives me the seed, and then and most of the, the, the time with the composers, it's like that. Mm -hmm. They give you the seed, and then you just take it and go from there, and, mm -hmm. and where they want to take it. And, and that's part of the fun of this, is you get to sort of interpret the, these, you know, it's like, I have this great thing when I did a mix years ago with Don Gaiman on, um, oh, on a wow. Bruce Hornsby song, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said something to me like, do you think the guitar needs more yellow? And of course, everyone has those ways of looking at it, and I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at him, look at the console at Larrabee, and 
then it dawns on me he's looking at the high frequency EQ, which has a yellow cap. So, Ooh. so for him, yellow was a, a li literal thing of yellow. But a lot of times, you get things like I, Chris Lord Algae loves the word spank. You know, oh, yeah. we don't use the word spank as much. It's you know, we we have whatever language ever. You know, I have one one composer I work with who's constantly um, turning things into sexual innuendo. So, <laughs> so everything has something to do with, with dick length, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> no matter what it is. And, and, uh, uh, more woody, more woody. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's more graphic It's more than cock. That. You know? I got it's you, like, I got you. Sorry about that. I wrote, sorry, I wrote, world. Yeah, I was, if I wrote that particular dick yeah. length score, it'd be a short score. I, I, I knew you were going there. I'm a Jew from Brooklyn, so, so I totally um, understand that. No, you know, when, you, when you're hung like me, sometimes but, you try But then to, to take it to the other together, side yeah. of that, if you look at a score like King Kong, which mm -hmm. is completely orchestral, and was, there was such a, a tight time frame that we didn't have time to do things in separate passes, we recorded the entire thing together. We had 125 musicians out in the room wow. live. Five percussionists and a timpanist, two pianos, two harps, full strings, full brass, double woodwinds, all live at Sony. And so that's the other side of it. So you have to really think of these as two different, you know, it's, you know, like one is rugby and one is football, you mm -hmm. know, and they're both, it's, it's an oblong ball that has to get over there, but mm -hmm. there's two different ways to uh, go and, at and it. Could, could this be accomplished in a, in a non-digital world? I mean, how... how uh, well, um, I mean, and was for years and years by very, very talented people, but uh, certainly the fact that we're in a digital world has changed the method for working. It's opened up, you know, the ability to move very quickly and to do things in multiple passes. If you plan out your sessions, one of the biggest things that, that I deal with is preparation. I'm, I, the secret to success is preparation. Mm. And uh, yeah, abs yeah, yeah. Uh, in of every aspect of, of the world, if you're doing a surgery, uh, open heart do. surgery, Absolutely. or recording an orchestra, or Pensado's doing place. Or, <laughs> or Pensado's place, or, <laughs> or recording a lead vocal, Absolutely. you know, with one yeah. microphone, one preamp, and maybe a compressor. Wow. It's all about preparation. Have That's plugins, have plugins uh, made your, your, your life easier? In the mix room. In the mix room. I don't tend to use plugins. I don't tend to use anything. If we're still on the on this, the uh, orchestral recording, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't really do anything in the orchestral recording other than placing a microphone Mic mm. and picking the right preamp to go with that. Um, and I have specific yeah, you've got preamps some I use. Really esoteric preamps. Well, not really. I you know uh, I do, but uh, well, most of the stuff. Well, 1061 is your most normal. Well, uh, now I actually uh, I have um, these remote control Grace preamps. I have 48 of them. And, uh, and I control everything from a centralized remote control, so I can have the preamps out in the studio with the players where I have the shortest mic run to the preamp, and then I can control everything from a center location, mm -hmm. and I can control 48 mics at a time. So the only thing I don't put in there sometimes, and sometimes I even do that, is my main five microphones that 80% of the sound, you have to know that you're getting 80% of the sound from these five mics, and everything else is how you want to you know, color the the orchestral recording because it's all about these tiny shades of color, my, mm -hmm. you know, minute level changes in, mm -hmm. in spot mics and stuff that really give you the the advantage and, and the different colors. So for the most part, I, I use these graces because A, they're super clean, and B, they're centrally located. And C, I have a remote control right in front of me, and it's recallable. So I tend to be able to move very quickly um, we have to record now. In a mod one thing that's changed in the modern world uh, with digital recording is we've gone from a world where they were happy if they recorded six minutes a session. That's six minutes a three-hour session. To now we record between eight and nine minutes an hour. So we're recording 25 minutes a session of music, mm. and it's because of that, my part of the world, the world I control, the technical side, the studio side has to just be a tuned Ferrari engine. Yeah. And, and we just don't have any. No room for error. There's no options anymore. So. And, and I don't get any, there's no sound getting. There's no like, you know, violins play, violas play, right. celli play, right. forget you it. You that. are, you're hitting record from the yeah. first second, 10.01, you're in record. So oh. prep is even more critical. Well, oh. prep, prep becomes, you know, listening to people have conversations underneath microphones and knowing what microphones you're putting up 
and knowing where the preamps start and it's being able to tell yeah. if one of your microphones has a colorization, a color coloration that you're not used to, mm -hmm. or something like that. You have to know that when you hit play uh, and record, everything that first pass is going to be usable. Yeah. Because that first pass might end up being in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. The pressure that you're under, I don't think. Uh, uh, See, for me, it's not that, pressure. For it's me, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's your like, Alan Myers. It's, I mean, it's, it's my adrenaline it, it rush. It's, it's like it's my bungee cord. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. I love uh, it. Um, wow. Was it fun working with Daft Punk on the Tron? On the Tron, it was maybe? tremendous. There's an example of, and that was one I didn't actually get to record because they wanted to go to London, and uh, and since we were mixing already, by the time we were recording orchestra, I had to stay back here and mix. But um, you know, first of all, a chance to bring my record world and my uh, film world together. And especially with a band like Daft Punk, because a lot of the stuff I did in the record world was sort of European pop dance, mm -hmm. punchy kind of stuff. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, they came, they programmed the crap out of the stuff, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And then and they're working in stereo, <clears throat> and then I have to take their world and turn it into this world of 5.1 surround, and then add orchestra and not make it sound like it's two different things. And that was a challenge, but I think that first of all, I think they pulled off doing a film score incredibly yeah, that well. That score is amazing. And I, I really was honored and, and loved the opportunity because what they asked for me is my everything. They said, just bring all of your expertise. Nothing you can say is the wrong thing to say. Nothing you can try is the wrong thing to try. You know. And the great thing about film is, you know, I don't have radio to worry about. Right. I don't have to fit, I don't have formats to, to worry about. Right. We can take eight marimbas and make a score out of it, and if we do it cool, then it's acceptable. You know, it's not like, oh, you can't use background vocals and get it played on these stations or stuff <laughs> like that. Oh, nice. You know, it, it's you really, it's just about making really cool, unique music. You know? So. Yeah. Uh, did 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 uh, did Pharrell and NERD did they fall in love with you because of the Daft Punk or was it the other way around? Um, you know, because you just mixed some stuff for Pharrell and right, NERD, right? Um, and the Pharrell thing kind of happened because Pharrell had already been involved. With, it was sort of a, a perfect storm because Pharrell became involved with a project Hans was doing and this wonderful. Brazilian composer and guitarist named Heitor Pereira, who is just wow. one of the greatest. Uh, he was in Simply Red. He was a guitar player in Simply yeah. Red for 10 years. Oh. And uh, Heitor and Pharrell were doing a score to this movie, Despicable Me, which mm -hmm. I mixed. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Pharrell and Hans were working with Dave Stewart and uh, Heitor and uh, this girl, Amory Calhoun, on something else. And at the same time, I was doing Tron and Daft Punk was brought in to do the first single on the NERD album. Mm. So I did a rough mix, and it stuck. It, I, you know what that's yeah, like. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you just kind of hit it, mm -hmm. and yeah. I, you know, I know what it's like when uh, when a rough mix comes comes in. Then Alan Myerson did it. I just go home. I, I can't. Well, you know, I was, know what that's like. Well, first of all, you're insane, and second of all, <laughs> uh, that was a case. It, it was even crazier than that. They. For, uh, uh, Daft Punk programmed up a song for NERD and then asked me to, before they had anything on it, to mix it so that they could take my mixed sounds and stem them off so that they could reprogram based on the mixed version of the sounds. I like that. And that's what happened. And then that became the final mix. Mm, mm. So that was kind of a cool end around. It was sort of like a double reverse back around forward pass of how to do a pop record and it just actually really worked well. When you're, oh, I'm sorry, go oh, no, I was going to say um, given, you know, I play Call of Duty so given the richness of that <laughs> which sometimes I see commercials or see PSAs or something about the war yeah. and it's not that much different than looking at Call of Duty yeah. and that footage, right. is there a difference in mixing for a video game and a film, particularly when the picture and density and richness is that. Yeah. Toss in, toss in records too. Add records as a third difference. Yeah, there is a difference because, well, first of all, most of the mm. people that are going to listen to Call of Duty are going to listen out computer speakers. Exactly. Or they're going to listen on headphones, they're going to listen in stereo. 
although we do do surround mixes, the surround mixes aren't the primary mm -hmm. focus. So, so you have to make sure that your migration from surround down to stereo, down to computer speakers, down to mono Takes works. Because, because a lot of my son, my 10 year old, yeah. you know, forget Absolutely. about it. For I mean, of all the things I've done in the world, the thing, call you know, duty. Call, forget oh, about so you're, you're it. And Metal on, Gear Solid, metal one, two, and three, oh, you yeah, know, it's you like, go. forget it. Absolutely. So, so uh, and, and uh, we, we, you know, when I mix that stuff, uh, I have to treat it almost like a trailer. So when we mix trailers, uh, you know, if anyone's gone to the movies in the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years, they mm -hmm. realize that trailers tend to sound louder than the movies no a lot question. of times. Yeah. Although we've, you know, movies have gotten much louder and clearer. And now movies are actually going down in level. Mm. We're, we're quieting movies down to a 3 dB because we, we kind of hit the wall and realized that it wasn't making a better movie. Mm -hmm. But uh, trailers de do tend to be loud. Uh, we tend to use more compression, get, get stuff to hit a little bit more fronty, don't worry about the depth quite as much. Mm. So, so we try to be a little less subtle. We're not competing in the same way uh, with other sounds. And in video games, we take that to the next level, mm. where we really do want, almost like a pop record, once the meter gets up to there, we don't really want to see it move that much. Mm. Mm. So, so we, I do keep that in mind when I'm mixing video games, that I have to keep my loudness up there. You know, but I have to keep my low end full. You know, I can't, I can't let that low end get away from me. And also, we need to use, you know, the, the tricks that plugins give us to make the low end sound apparent on small speakers. So I'm pulling out those types of plugins that give you that sort of apparent can, loudness. Can you name one or two of those? Plugins? Yeah, like the Waves R bass or the or the you know Max bass and stuff like that. Oh, gotcha. Now the you know the new low uh, I use lo-fi a lot. I, I use lo-fi set to point <coughs> 1 or point 2 and uh, I use a lot of distortion general distort harmonic generators. Mm -hmm. um, and I use very little amounts of them and I just use them to just crank up some of the harmonic content and stuff especially low end and especially low end that sounds a little sine wavy like certain synth basses and oh, gotcha. and uh, you know 909s and 808s and stuff like that Good. I have to add some sawtooth to that or on those small speakers it's not really going to pop through it, especially when you're dealing with bombs you know when you're dealing with like a competing with mm -hmm. you know the sound of gunshots right. and bombs and stuff I mean in rec radio and records, we have the same problem, except we're not competing with bombs and gunshots <laughs> and dialogue. I'm, I'm such an idiot about that world, so uh, I, I'm going to take a risk and ask some dumb questions. Please. But, but when you, like, like the classic example of, of, of what you do, I, I sometimes imagine like my, miles of consoles and more than one person at the console that's right. when they actually put the mu the, the music into the film right that's called the dub when it's combining the music the dialogue and the sound effects is when you have the big three what used to be a three-man console it's now a two-man console for the most part so when you're doing your music and right. you know there's going to be a lot of explosions with a lot of that rumbly low end mm. do, do you do anything differently I have a relationship with the, with the sound effects department most of the time and you know, I'm fortunate to work on the, the type of movie where we can have meetings like this. And, oh, wow. and uh, so I, I'll get the pre-dub from them. The pre-dub is the, their pre-mix, you know, their sort of, mm -hmm. their almost done mix. And I'll listen and have access to the dialogue and the sound effects in a pretty finished state mm -hmm. so that I know what I'm up against. Mm -hmm. You know, like I know that, okay, I can forget about this, this bass drum or this percussion effect right here because mm -hmm. there's you know a car crash and mm -hmm. I've got layer and layer of sound effects there so forget it so I'm not going to bother trying to get my low end out of that or I might the composer might listen and go well let's move the sound you know f 10 frames or oh, okay. 300 milliseconds later so that we have a chance to have our moment so mm -hmm. we, we can play that a little bit of that sort of give and take mm -hmm. when we have the right preparation time again you know if 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 I were to go today and get hired to do um, Pirates of the Caribbean or Caribbean Part Fifty One, 
you, you'd what, shoot yourself. What, what would be my biggest mistake that I would make bringing a, a, a record sensibility to the to the process? What would be my biggest mistake I would make? Well, I mean, more than more than many other movies, you'd, that's a great movie to bring your record. I mean, well, look, one of the things that that gave me the opportunity to be successful in film was bringing my record sensi sensibilities to it. They okay. loved the fact that I came from a record world. Oh wow! And and that I was bringing the. Well, describe this, how you got how, how you got into that world. Well, I you know. Sort of hip hop happened, and I wasn't I, I wasn't the right guy for hip hop, you know, and I just didn't enjoy it, and and uh, you know I had spent a lot of time trying to develop a, a, a reputation doing pop records, mm -hmm. and especially in my case R and B records and European pop and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and just as I was about to kind of cross the threshold to the next level, the, you know the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, mm -hmm. and and uh, it stopped really, and and uh, hip hop came in. Uh, my mid-tempo ballads were turning into mm. mid-tempo hip-hop, you know, rap records, and and you know, I'm a Jewish kid from Brooklyn. You know, I'm not really. That's it wasn't me, and mm. and uh, I was frustrated, and and um, and I think I always had sort of a, a sort of theatrical version of what records should sound like. I always, I kind of thought of it in an emotional content, you know, and I think that might have been one of my downfalls in pop production and pop mixing was. That I was, I get caught up in the sounds, you know, the the the, um, mm -hmm. the uh, cinema scope of the record. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dave Way used to say that to me. He, yeah. He'd say, "Stop worrying so much about that. And just you know, get that vocal in those drums." And yeah. I'm like, "But I can't stop. I can't stop. I have to like pump the keyboards out into the live room and record it back in and flange it. And you know, I have to. I have mm -hmm. to." Um, so, so uh, I met Hans, you know, basically through a very long and uninteresting story. I met Hans, and and uh, I did one session for him, and he really enjoyed working with me, and he knew the Brian Ferry record. Oh, okay. And uh, and so that bet, bet noir, bet noir, yeah. And and that one session turned into three sessions, and that three sessions turned into four months, and that four months now has turned into seventeen and a half years. Wow. Oh, okay. And uh, and wow. my client base has expanded and contracted, and mm -hmm. as client bases tend to do, mm -hmm. you know they shift and change. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna change up the mood a little bit. Uh, I was talking earlier, uh, and Herb knew me during this time. Herb, Herb managed me then too. Uh, I wanted to be Alan Myerson so bad, Herb. He bought a red 300 ZX. <laughs> <laughs> I, I loved the that first, car. The first paycheck I got, I went and bought one. Did you really? I couldn't find a red one, so I I, I, I compromised and got a blue one. But mm. I, I, I was the first new car I ever bought, and I bought it 100% because Alan Myerson had a twin turbo red 300 ZX with... Um, what do you call those things where the roof comes off on T -bar either T-bar roof? T-bar roof. Oh, right, right, and, right, right. Um, I love that car. I, you know, later on in my life, I loved mine too. I tried to find a perfect used 1990 red 300ZX, sort of as a celebration, which never happened. But um, unfortunately, my that was that was sort of a victim of my first divorce. Was that car? Oh, gotcha. <laughs> that was gotcha. the first thing to go. Gotcha. On uh, on that Brian Ferry record, yeah. uh, if, uh, if if you guys. I, I don't know if it's on Spotify. I should have done my homework, but check, check that record out. Um, Bet Noir, B B E T E N O I R E. That's correct. Um, one of the things that just I never could do. I still try to this day. We use this. We both use the Bricasti reverbs, and I, and, yes. and, and and of course I, I I try to find what what settings you use uh, through subterfuge. <laughs> and I still can't like. You like, gotta do is call me. <laughs> I know, but that's cheating. I know. Like, like when you think of a of a reverb, you don't think of a of adding something to the sound. You you're thinking of a reverb as has a different usage in your in your brain. Like like is is that something you can like delineate? Like like to me, it sounds like you use reverb as a front to rear pan knob, or sometimes you use reverb just to. To, to make to, to change the intimacy of the vocal or for different you don't use it just because you're supposed to put reverb on a vocal right uh, can, can you can you give in some insight to our audience because uh, uh, you I think sure. you're the best that has ever been at reverb uh, I, I would argue that but I'll t I will take your compliment and and uh, John enjoy, Nettlesby would agree John it. get on the chat room and tell him I'm right uh, John Nettlesby <laughs> love John Nettlesby 
Um, you know, reverb has a few different. It does. For, I, I use reverb to add emotional content to to something where where I make it. Well, everything I do about mixing music is to make me feel something. Mm -hmm. You know, um, everything, every idea I have, every technical concept I have is trying to evoke an emotional response for me. So there are some reverbs that, um, and I learned this from a guy named, um, I'll think about it, when he was mixing a Bronsky beat record many, many Bronsky years ago. And he, he had used the same reverb on two different sends and had the, one of the sends with all the top rolled off and the bottom rolled up and one of the sends with all the bottom rolled off and the top rolled on and would sit there with those two reverb settings and find like just the perfect EQ to the input of the reverb to get sort of what he wanted, the juiciness of the sound. Or, or the splash of the sound, as opposed to using two different reverbs. So, so let, let me stop you because I, 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 I got lost. So, so one reverb essentially has less low, less low end information, and right. the other so, has, has so less both, top. So both sends had a pull tech on them. Oh, okay. And one pull tech had the had the attenuation all the way up on the low end, uh -huh. and one pull tech had the attenuation all the way up on the top end. Okay. So one and that then, was a low pass and a high so pass. So if you wanted a full range version of the reverb, you would just take send one and send two and make them equal. Oh. And then if you wanted it to be a little warmer, you'd back off send one. And if you wanted it to be a little and, thinner, and what, you would what, back what, off send two. What, what determined which one you would use? Just your emotional feeling? Emotional feeling. And, and so, so I took that, like, like you said at the beginning, which I think is one of the truest statements, is you take other people's ideas and you run with it. You make your own thing out of it. If you try to emulate someone's idea verbatim, it doesn't work. No. All you do is copying. Right. And, and that doesn't work. What you have to do is, is, is make an amalgam of ideas. I take Dave Pensado's ideas on snare compression, and I take uh, this one's ideas on, on keyboard reverb, and this one's ideas on vocal front end and stuff like mm -hmm. that, and I build my own sound out of it. Mm. And that's what I've tried to do through the years. So my thing about reverb, vocal reverb, uh, pop vocal reverb, was always just trying to create an emotional thing. So, it, so uh, if it was a big, warm Howard he, uh, Hewitt ballad, show, I would want that. Uh, I, show me, uh, the song's called Show Me, S-H-O-W, me, yeah. me, Howard Hewitt. Right. Th th to me, that's one of my top favorite right. uses of reverb. That there, there, there are two reverbs going on, one you don't hear and one you do hear. The one you don't hear is just this kind of low in warmth that bathes the vocal and just gives it this sort of, you know, it's like a blanket of love, you know. I can't think of another way to put it other no, than I, that. No, I understand. And the other one is to allow, is the one that you do hear that gives it sort of that, that splash, that throw that you want to hear in an R&B ballad, you know, where, mm -hmm. where you do get the sense that there is that, that space, that thing where you do want the sibilant to kind of catch the reverb a little bit, so there is a little trail of, of s in the mm -hmm. in the reverb, and and uh, and that's the reverb that if I have a delay, I'll put my delay into that reverb. So if I'm running a quarter note and an eighth note, or a, a quarter note and a dotted eighth note delay, or something like mm -hmm. that, or whatever I'm you running. You put the delay into the brighter reverb. Uh, I do. I did on that record. Oh, okay. I, I don't know why I remember that, but I do remember that. Uh, the lower one is just really. I don't want to mess up the low end. I don't want to mess up the timing of the record. So I keep that as pure as I can. Okay. And the one that's on the top end, I can just put a little bit in, and it wor a little bit does a lot. So, so I'll do that. And, and uh, so in those in that on that record. I would have used two different reverbs. I honestly can't remember which ones they were. What, what's your thinking about uh, pre-delays? Right, I like them. I do too. <laughs> I, I like long ones. I like yeah. eighth note pre-delays. Yeah. How do you? What's your philosophy about in, that? In pop records or? Yeah. In, um, well, you know, I come from New York at a place called A and R Recording, where they invented a little box called the AR1, which was the tape eliminator, mm -hmm. which was based on a Scully tape recorder running it. 15 IPS, which was exactly 120 milliseconds between the record head and the playback head. So that number 120 has always stuck with me mm -hmm. throughout my entire career. That's I my, consider that the classic slap number. That's exactly right. That's exactly where I start with a pre-delay on a reverb is 120 milliseconds, and um, 
and uh, if and then I go up or down from there. Oh. Um, but uh, through the years, I've you know that's gotten because I've sort of got more into mm -hmm. the European style, which which uh, they would actually it wasn't uh, the tape delay was actually set up on the console. It wasn't uh, it wasn't inserted like in New York. We inserted directly from the send to the tape recorder or the or the delay mm -hmm. to the reverb. Mm -hmm. And so you you just had that slap, that 120 millisecond slap. I, I got a, uh, can I ask you a quick philosophical question? Absolutely. While you, while you warm your arm up for batter's box. Gotcha. This is just, a lot of our audience um, learns. Either they're in schools or programs right. they learn from us. Um, and so I'm, I, and as a manager, I'm constantly sort of thinking about the future. And right, I the, love that. The business changed, and yeah. you may change just because of it, and I think our audience has to. It strikes me there's so much media consumption now on screen. Yes. That if you're learning this craft in some shape, form, or fashion, you need to learn to mix to something on screen. Could be a small screen, could be a big screen. Could absolutely. Be, don't you think, do you agree? I absolutely agree, and I think that um, that point was really uh, uh, taken home when when the industry tried to uh, put 5.1 music mixes out there as part of the industry and found no audience because people aren't going to sit in one spot without anything in front of them and listen to music. Yeah. Now, if they're in their car, like Elliot Shiner did a, uh, a car uh, yeah. system, um, that's one thing. But if they want to listen, if you want to get them in one spot, you have to put something in front of them, yeah. be it a movie or now a video game mm -hmm. or your YouTube or, your or, or, or this, you yeah, know. Exactly. And, and uh, so, yes, there's a, a tremendously new world in the terms of, of the formats, what we call the migration mm -hmm. of mixes, mm -hmm. where you start with the most pristine form of the highest fidelity you could start with, with, with you know, frequencies from 20 to 20K, and you go down and down and down until you're, you're basically at an earbud. Mm -hmm. And how to get the most out of all of those worlds. And, and uh, so I think that that's an important thing for especially people starting now to realize that that is the world they're going into. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. Why don't we uh, tee up batter's box? I'm ready. Oh Will's God. rolling that graphic. There it is. And uh, fire away, Mr. Pensado. I, I have a feeling that you're going to get a lot knocked out of the park. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, this could be God. the best one we've ever done. By the way, I'm sorry if I'm boring everyone. You're not, no, you're no, 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 no. You, you in fact, tell how uh, good you are by how interested we are. Uh, <laughs> traditionally, we, 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 we say begging our guests to come back for another show for the end of the show. I'll just but, beg now. Yeah, well, we might as well get that out of the way right now. You're gonna be oh, I'd love to come back. I oh, would love to have you. Okay, so uh, Batter's Box, uh, you're rewarded for brevity and speed. Um, <laughs> acoustic guitars. Strumming or a lead? Strumming. Strumming a small cap condenser up the knee about the 12th fret. <laughs> nice. Damn. <laughs> uh, wow. Snare, live snare. Live snare, uh, 57 tape to a KM84 with a 10 dB pad on the top. Uh, and if you needed a bottom snare mic, uh, uh, usually I believe it or not, use an ECM50 with the Whoa. phase reversed. Whoa. You, know, it, it, you, can, you can give me mixed things too. You can give me plugins, whatever. Oh, you want you, some of that too? No, that's whatever comes to your mind. That, that was beautiful. Okay. I shouldn't have stopped. Uh, acoustic piano. My brand new Flea C12s that I just <laughs> bought that just sound absolutely amazing. Uh, for, for film, uh, outside of the lid, about two feet. For pop, I just keep moving closer and closer to the lid until it's the right sound. A little bit of compression. Um, recently, I've been using the, um, uh, the um, uh, Puig Tech uh, Fairchild. Oh, yeah. uh, a little bit of that and um, um, some pleasure. sort of sparkly reverb. Cool. Uh, acoustic bass. Acoustic bass, good one. Uh, I love it. Uh, uh, um, I mic uh, where the fingers are uh, over here on the bridge with uh, anything from um, a small cap condenser to an SM57, depending on the style. And then I mic the body uh, with either uh, one of my new Flea 47s um, or a ribbon mic, a Coles 4038, or a Royer. Uh, on the body, uh, I find I put my ear to it to listen to the hot spot. Mm -hmm. I find that and I put it there, and I combine the two of them. Okay, uh, uh, that's that's incredible. Uh, I lost my place here. Uh, electric guitar, uh, fifty-seven. I mean, yes, I can add a Royer and 
and uh, an 87, but the truth is you can make a record with a 57 and a nail. Mm. Um, synthesized bass, like a sine wavy bass. Sine wavy bass, I'll use a little bit of harmonic distortion mixed in with it, so I'll add a lo-fi or I'll add a little bit. I'm um, big on the Sound Toys Decapitator now, oh, yeah. and I, I'll set that to um, you know just a tiny little bit and mix it in. I don't tend to use compression that much on it because they tend to come to you pretty flat already, yeah. and, uh, and I do that. Stereo bus. Wow. <laughs> uh, Manly, Vary Muse, special, specially Alan Meyerson modified, love, nothing sounds like it in the world, my Vary Mew compressor and uh, either a massive passive or an ear uh, 825 uh -huh. stereo EQ yeah. on the bus. Right. And then a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of L2 at the end. The ear is like a Fairchild kind of emulation, guys. Um, well, oh, no, that's the compressor, the ear EQ, oh, the, which, uh, which, oh. which is, which uh, is doesn't have any, it's not parametric, it's, it doesn't have any control over the bandwidth, it's just these big gaping oh. frequencies that you like just add one, exactly. You just add a little bit of. Okay. Right. Um, I lost my place again. Vocals. Wow. Um, uh, depends. Uh, microphone. Let's say, let's say a lead vocal chick. Lead vocal chick, uh, if she'd be <laughs> LVC. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, good question. It, depending on the singer, I, you know, I have either my 47 or my C12. One of the two of them usually will work. I'll usually put up both mm -hmm. and see which one works the best. Mm -hmm. um, I do a tiny, tiny bit of compression on the way in, and uh, I've been using my Summit for that. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, in the mix, um, I've been just using, it depends. It's, there is not one thing other than to say that I do try to get the level pretty even and uh, so that I can hear all the words, and I like hearing all of these. So you try to get even going to tape? And uh, just a tiny bit okay. going to tape, more for her mm -hmm. than, than for anything else, so that she, when she, that I don't have to pull her down in her headphones for her to hear everything. It sort of keeps it so that she's hearing everything when she's singing, more than I need to have everything uh, recorded in there perfectly like that. So, gotcha. yeah. Okay. And very, very important uh -huh. is whatever level I think I need to record, I drop it 4 dB. Because oh. no matter what I think it is, she's going to blow me up. So I'm going to bring it down 4 dB just to make sure. Gotcha. Okay, I'm going to ask you strings, but I just want processing, not mic technique. Live strings. Um, Procasti reverb, um, <laughs> usually program one, setting one, and and uh, the hall. Uh, yes, I love. I, I can't uh, get off that setting. It's a great setting. Play with the pre delays and play with the high frequency cutoff, and you got yeah. it made. Um, and uh, I use my manly massive passes across the bus, um, and um, uh, it's about balance. It's about how much room versus how much spot mic. Uh, have I got time for a couple more questions? You have, well, time for one more, and then we got a couple corner cues. Uh, okay. Uh, when, 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 when you think of a need for pristine high end, what's your, what's your analog choice and what's your um, plug in choice? Your plug in choice, I guess, would be the massive passive. But Not necessarily. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I, I love the, um, sorry. Oh, no problem. I love the uh, UAD Cambridge for top oh, end yeah. also. Love it, um, and you know the MDW, the the, the Massenburg one also. So I, I, I'll use different ones. Um, uh, is my digital choice um, my analog choice? I like the ear. I like the massive passive. Um, um, it's the ear and the massive passive right now is really the ones I'm using the most. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the Mercury. Whew. I've been using the Mercury. EQ. What's it's that? an EQP1. It's sort of a, a Poltec style oh. EQ that I have three of. You know, as a everything I do, I have to do in threes. Does, as does, LCR. Does, uh, does Vintage King carry the Mercury? Where it does. I? Okay, cool. Yeah. I think we're gonna have to create the Babe Ruth Award. <laughs> <laughs> we just we just saw a master <laughs> in it. Each one. Of, I've never been excited over matters. Normally, well, like normally this. when we have a guest, yeah. I can follow along. You know, because. Uh, I'm, I'm like, I'm Vintage I'm like, King is, is uh, by the way, this is not a plug because I don't have any, but Vintage King is great. You know, I buy a lot of gear from Vintage King. Yeah, we Vintage King is like you can't afford to have $100,000 worth of musicians out there and use a piece of vintage gear and wonder if it's going to work. Right. Vintage King, they just, right. their stuff just. They're the bomb. Top. They're quality. the bomb. 
Drew, tee up one or two quick ones, please. Gotcha. Uh, one quick one from Rob Johnson. How do you go about mixing hybrid elements with orchestral elements? Oh, great. In, like in Tron, or et cetera. Um, I try to make, I, I try to decide what space is going to be inhabited by, by different elements. Like when you deal with low end in a hybrid world, it, since the low end is so dense, you have to kind of clear the orchestra away from that so that you don't get conflict. So, so I try to, I try to give, you know, uh, the hybrid elements, the space they need do. Usually if they're hybrid elements, the people have been working on them for a long time and are going to want to hear them. So the trick is to then get in as much liveness as you can. It's not usually the other way around where they're going to want to hear a super ton of orchestra mm -hmm. and a little bit of their hybrid elements. Their hybrid elements are the mix. Mm -hmm. And then you have to sort of bring the stuff up to, uh, to uh, one, complement it. One thing, guys, when, 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 he, when, when Alan says he, he rolls some stuff away, he, it's not like ADDB starting at, 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 at 500. These are subtle moves. Don't, right. don't go crazy DB on this DB and stuff. a half at 220. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's, it's that, very that's subtle stuff. That's actually a DB and a half at 220. I've learned that from Bob Clearmountain. DB oh. and a half at 220. Wow. Go ahead, Drew. Cool. Uh, another one from Mike Van Olden. 5.1 mixing versus stereo. What are some of the rules for mixing a 5.1 that a stereo mixer might not be aware of? That's, that's a... That's a, that's Thanks for the course. question, Mike. Um, uh, very, very important is if you imagine sitting in a theater, and if you're thinking theatrically, and if you're sitting on the left side of the theater, remember that the center channel is actually your right speaker. So you can't look at the center channel as, as the center of your mix anymore. What the center of your mix is, is an equal distribution between the left, the center, and the right. Ooh. So when you want to make something sound like it's coming from the center, like, like a bass or a bass drum, you have to put it into all three of the speakers equally. So that's mm. rule number one. Vocal does not go in the center uh, channel. It'll sound little and tiny. It has to go into the left, the center, and the right relatively equally. If you want it to be a little bit pushed in the center, a couple of dB, that's OK. And that preserves your axis. Right. And then in terms of dealing with surround, um, uh, you, you know, it, it depends on what your 5-1 environment is. Um, you, you, re, obviously, reverb returns. We don't. We try to avoid putting anything with sharp transients in the surround unless it's really planned ahead of time. So hi hats don't really work that well in the surrounds for two reasons. One, you don't know the quality of the surround speakers it's going to be played back on, and you don't know if they're in phase and if they're set up properly. Subwoofer, as little as possible. You want the mix to sound good no matter where they listen, and most people don't have a subwoofer. So even if they have a 5.1, they're not really using that point one properly. So avoid using the subwoofer to create the low end for your bass drum and your bass. Avoid it. Use it for the effect, the occasional effect of making something big in the moment and then back out. And then make sure that if they didn't hear that, it would still sound like your music. I feel so inadequate. I'm still mixing in 1.1. 1 .1. I need to fan I, myself. Actually, I'm mixing in <laughs> 1.5, 1.05. This Incredible is, answer, Alan. Incredible. Go ahead, Drew. You got, you got oh, a couple got more. more. You got two more. Oh, cool. Um, I'm going to jump to this one from my producer, Will, actually. Uh, does the context of a particular movie play any role in influencing your mixed decisions for its score? If so, Great can question. you recall any unique examples? Uh, absolutely. 100%. Uh, uh, Inception was a music movie. If you listen to the mix on that, it, the music is louder than almost anything in the movie yep. and occasionally even dialogue. So we knew that we had the world at our balls with that movie <laughs> and that we could really uh, scream with low end, we could scream with size. Because the tried, CGI was just... If I tried the same thing with pirates, you would never hear the music because they would have pulled everything down. Mm. So, so you have to know what the movie you're doing is. You have to know who your sound effects designer is, you have to know who your mixer is to decide how you're going to shape the curve of the movie. And then when you get so into... there's politics involved, too. Well, there's politics, but there's also, you know, when you're in a dialogue-driven movie, mm -hmm. you don't want to put things in the center channel that much because that's where your dialogue's going to live. Mm -hmm. So if you have your clarinet solo in the center channel, the same moment dialogue's playing, then you're going to have a problem. Which brings up a whole concept of uh, a technical concept that you students should know about, which is masking, which means if you have a shaker and the hi-hat and they're both on the left, you can't hear either of them clearly. And if you pan one of them to the right, now you hear the shaker and the hi-hat clearly. The same thing with uh, mixing for film. If you just take that clarinet and move it to 10 o'clock, all of a sudden it's not going to fight with the dialogue. So you have to be very subtle about the way you create center channels in dialogue-driven movies like romantic comedies, 
or or heavy dialogue. Through, and for an example, would be like it's complicated, which is right. a movie I did last year. Right. Or would the you Prestige had been that Prestige kind of is exactly a perfect okay, example so where was, that I movie. To, I got so many questions about. It's such a great movie and it's such a great score yeah, and absolutely. a lot went into that because do I have two seconds to explain that? All time you want. So that was Herb a score. The question. You got six days. You might have, this might be it's a like time problems show. when I ask the questions. Uh, I did a movie called Traffic a yes. while back and that was Fantastic. an incredible score. But the thing that they wanted to do with that score is keep it electronic, but they wanted it to sound organic. How do you take an electronic score and make it sound organic? Mm. So I had this idea I was going to take it to Capitol Studios, mm -hmm. pump the synths through the room, and mic it in surround. Mm. So I did that, and it was a hit. Oh it was just a tremendous uh, hit to the point where they decided that they were going to mix the rest of the movie in mono. So all of the effects, all of the ADR, all of the what we call walla, this, the crowd sounds and everything was mono. And every time the music came up, it just came up everywhere. Oh my goodness! And came down and went back to mono. It was just, mm. it was stunning. So when the press did you feel came that up, when you saw her? Well, you know, you wouldn't know it. What it's, it's, it's okay. the emotional effect it gives you. I just saw a Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, uh, and you Trent did that Reznor, too. No, I didn't. Oh, you didn't. Trent no, Reznor I and I think Atticus. So some, Atticus Ross. Atticus Ross, and. It struck me how much he got it correct and just propelled the yeah. story. This is a very dense, it's two hours and 40 minutes. I'd love to that. work with Trent. Trent's the new man on the block. Man, his stuff smokes. Yeah. Well, However, you know where he's from, Nine Inch Nails. Absolutely, yeah. of course. And and I had deals with Interscope while he was yeah. there. And even in Nine Inch Nails, yeah, some yeah. of the stuff he was doing. Um, and then I have so many questions where I won't take up much time. But when you have a movie where the music distracts, right. which I won't mention, it's jarring. It, right. You're just full of negative impulses. So right. when when you see something as, and I had sort of all these period pieces questions for you, something like the Prestige, right. and the nuance in the Prestige, right. and you're watching well, and something complicated. And, and that's Chris Nolan. I mean, Chris exactly. Nolan is a master, master at. at you, Chris Nolan takes what you give him, and he makes he he can take. He could take lemons and turn it into like vintage lemonade mm -hmm. made by the, mm -hmm. made in the waters of Capri. Yeah, you know, he's like he's the king. He's like Jeffrey Carey. But, the, but you know, with that score, that was a, a very very kind of off the beat composer who who uh, had, didn't do a lot of big Hollywood movies, mm. and it was very synthy. And Chris was concerned, and I said, "Let me try this idea." And he goes, "Well, you can try the idea, but you know, I'm not big on like new stuff coming at me. So, you know, try it. Here's the money to do it. Right. If I don't use it." Don't be hurt. I'm like, no problem. So I went and I did it, and he loved it. And we ended up just using like pieces of the yes. room sound from Capitol, edited Ooh. down as cues. Ooh. You know, so it sort of sparked a whole nother thing. So that wow. idea of going to Capitol, pumping stuff out in the room, and miking it back up has sort of become. There's a word for it in the industry, which I don't particularly care for, called worldizing. Mm. Um, and uh, it's a word that came out of Apocalypse Now mm. when they were doing Apocalypse Now. Um, I, 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 I feel like I might have helped that process become used again in modern filmmaking is this concept of going in and re-recording stuff. They did it on the Ray Charles movie, which I wasn't involved with, to very good effect. Going, you know, put, playing music outside of a room and miking it on the other side of a door and instead of like just filtering it and doing it with EQ oh, and plugins, wow. yeah. That's pretty cool. I, was, I, I know so little about that world. Drew, one more quick one. One more quick one? Yeah. Okay, uh, it's for Dave and Alan. I know uh, from 20, the remix, sorry. I know a healthy lifestyle is what many top engineers, <laughs> producers recommend for creativeness. Any tips for staying fresh and creative when getting eight hours of rest is just not possible? Get a good assistant and take a lot of naps. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, you know, for me, I can't, I can't speak for anybody else, but... Um, the, you would think coffee, caffeine would help you. It doesn't. It doesn't me. I can't speak for anybody else. But if I know I'm going to stay up late, I don't have any caffeine. I don't have any coffee, and I try to stay away from um, fried foods. I try to eat as little as possible. I try to keep my body having to work as little as possible, f digesting food and handling food, and using that energy towards the mix. And like Alan said, uh, a, a, a well-placed five-minute nap can give you an extra three, four hours worth of. Uh, energy. Uh, one quick thing, um, I said this on an earlier show, when you were a little kid and your dad woke you up at 4 a.m. to get a good spot at, at Disneyland, you woke up after three hours sleep, you were refreshed, you were excited the whole day, you never got a headache, life was great, but when your dad woke you up the same time to go get a root canal, I don't know why you'd have a root canal at five years old, 
um, you got a headache the rest of the day, your attitude is bad. Uh, more than you would think part of working long hours and staying fresh is just your attitude. Uh, you, you know that, Alan. It's like if it's a, if it's a great mix, a, I mean, if it's a great uh, tracks and, and you love the artist and, and your food came back and it was properly prepared, everything's great. It's just so much easier to, to stay awake and be creative than when, 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 when you pull up that first track and there's mm -hmm. distortion and you know you've got five hours to finish this mix and everything goes, it's like finding food on your fork when you sit down at a restaurant. Once it goes bad, everything goes bad. So This is a really stupid way to make a living if you're not passionate about it. That's a There's a lot to of better ways to make a living than this. Yep. Yeah. And so you, if you come into it with passion, the sleep isn't as bad of a problem, but, but it is important to rest, yeah. hydrate, you know, hydrate. do, all, the, do mm -hmm. all that stuff. Use common to, sense. Yeah, just use common sense. In the presence of greatness. Thank you. My so pleasure. Much. Will you come back, really? I absolutely will come uh, back. I, I only, hope you I only got through about 10% of oh, what I wanted to say. This iPad is full of Alan Myers' <laughs> stuff. I had it scratched. Well, so this was what a great way to start off the yeah, year. Yeah, Alan, thank you so much, uh, man. This thank is, you this for being an honor to be here. I hey, thought I knew everything. You have no idea how excited he was about this. <laughs> I heard it all. Um, That's awesome. What, what an incredible way for us to kick off the year. What a great way to satisfy the audience requests. Oh, 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 look what's coming in oh here. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness gracious. Look at here. Yeah, yeah. Congratu no Congratulations, everyone, on your, or to Dave and crew and everybody on your 50th episode. Oh, wow. and, and to you as well, Mr. Will. That's Absolutely. Great. There's Will, our producer. Come down here, Will, so folks can see Is this you. what you call healthy eating, by the way? Yeah, <laughs> this, is what you, this is what you want to avoid. Uh, you, uh, actually, we're just testing to see if can pull out all the candles. Uh, <laughs> there's more nutrition in the candles than the cake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just so kidding. you want to? Man, what a sweet thing! That's great. I, 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 come here, Drew. All right. I don't want to blow this stuff out. It's just too pretty. So you have your assistant blow it out. That's, yeah. that's living proof. Hey, of what? Okay, I'll, okay, I'll blow it out. Go ahead, man. Let's see if you can do it. Oh, I can do it. Okay, let's see. Are they trick candles? No, no. <laughs> wow, that was pretty aggressive. Hot air. <laughs> are, are we still on the air? We are. Please, Please sir. don't smoke. <laughs> Smoking is stupid. Don't smoke. Smoking yeah. is bad. Bad, go. bad, bad. There you go. Let's wrap up and get out. Uh, man, I don't know what to say that we haven't already said. Guys, great to be back with you. Um, hope you hope your holiday was as good as ours. And uh, you got. I mean, I, I'm gonna have to re rerun this episode 20 times just to get the full extent of, of the knowledge Alan shared with us. So don't don't be afraid to hit the rewind button. Um, if if there's any questions you have. Um, Put him up on Facebook. Alan will we'll tell Alan if he gets a chance. He's so busy. Uh, I'll, I'll either answer him or we'll try and get Alan to answer him. But what an incredible, incredible afternoon, Herb. Congratulations, brother. Oh, yeah. It's our Keep birthday. One year anniversary, huh? That's so, that's so weird. It's like. Uh, Th thanks, everybody. Yeah. Your, your support. What can we say? Uh, we wouldn't be here without you, and it's uh, going to be a big year. Thanks. Hi, right, guys. Manana.